Welcome to the Ask Faleschini podcast with a guest. I'm proud to present Terry Zimnier. Terry is a fractional cybersecurity executive from Atlanta, Georgia. Terry, please tell us more about yourself. What is your story? Yeah, good, good, good morning, Peter. Thank you for having me on, on your podcast. My, my story is, well, my career story anyway kind of breaks into three phases, and I'll skim through those quickly to kind of give you a context of where, I'm, where I'll be speaking about. Uh, early in my career, right out of college, I, I was the uh, cybersecurity tech guy. So I was doing all the cool bits and bytes stuff where I was a uh, penetration tester. They were paying me to break into companies. I was architecting big, complex solutions in the cybersecurity space. I was doing um, assessments on big entities, some, some working for some government entities, um, all that cool stuff back 25 years ago. And, and I enjoyed it. And it was fun. I got to play with a lot of cool things. Um, but a, the technology was starting to get harder and harder. So old school cybersecurity, um, I, I, I did pretty well because I was good at a lot of things, but not great at anything. But early 2000s, the technology started growing very quickly. So you think wireless and Bluetooth and all the things that were changed in the clouds and the virtualizations, cybersecurity became very specialized. You became a, a, a developer security guy or a network security girl, whatever it may be. Um, so at that point, I was kind of thinking, well, maybe I'm not sure this is a long term career path for me. And, and at that point, I was working at a cybersecurity consulting group. And one of the salespeople came around and said, hey, security guys, someone's asking about HIPAA. What's HIPAA? And none of us knew because we were a bunch of bits and bytes guys. And like, I don't know. And I kind of sheepishly raised my hand and said, well, I don't know. I'll, I'll figure it out. So I went and printed out the uh, U.S. regulations HIPAA, which is the healthcare privacy and cybersecurity stuff. And I printed out. 120 pages of, of federal regulations. And I read through it. I'm like, man, this is really cool stuff. So that kind of marked the transition of the second part of my career where I went into compliance. So um, starting with basic technology, now is transitioning and how do you apply this technology to a business? How do you, how do you actually secure and, 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 and properly protect information in businesses? So the second phase of my career, Peter, then became compliance as well as cybersecurity leadership. So uh, there was a distinct lack of cybersecurity executive presences presence in the early 2000s. And um, maybe because I was pretty good and maybe because there was a vacuum of leadership, I kind of rocketed up through the org chart. So um, I, I've got about a decade of experience as uh, vice president of cybersecurity, what they call chief information security officer at, at, at big healthcare organizations across the U.S. And that was great and that was fun. And, and that was exciting, um, though, frankly, working at big organizations is, is, is I found to be pretty stressful. Um, that then led me to the, the, the third and uh, current phase of my career, which I'm working as a fractional executive. So the idea is I'm a part-time executive cybersecurity uh, leader for multiple uh, companies. Uh, so it allows me to, to, A, deal with some of the technical stuff I enjoy playing with. It allows me to uh, continue to play also in that executive space to tie those both together. And I work for multiple com companies now as what you would call the fractional chief information security officer. Wow, amazing uh, career and a huge, um, you, you had to do a really huge uh, turnaround or, 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 or uh, switch because uh, technical uh, expertise is one thing, but then compliance is a whole new space. And then going back or not back, but uh, towards a uh, fractional executive when uh, you, you, you deal with m m multiple companies that have uh, so many different challenges. Uh, that, that is another universe of, of uh, its own. Uh, what I would like to ask for my uh, listeners and viewers is, uh, can you describe what um, average, uh, let's say, business owner or employee needs to know about cybersecurity and it's not the public knowledge. So far, we just know that we have to have a complex passwords and that we have to change them regularly. Uh, that is uh, public knowledge. Is there any uh, hands-on trick that uh, you can share with us regarding how to improve our cybersecurity, how to go about it? Uh, is there a mindset we have to assume in order to uh, act in a way that uh, will not uh, put us in danger. 
Yeah, I, I, I like the way you phrase the end of that, Peter. It's, it's the mindset. And I'll kind of walk through maybe two different perspectives. There's the mindset of the business leader, and then there's a the mindset of the individual. So, you know, it's you, it's your mom, your dad. As an individual or as an employee, you've got to be diligent and basically you've got to follow the rules that your technology lays out for you. So you know your bank requires multi-factor authentication. Multi-factor being I've got a name, I've got a password, maybe it calls me on my phone. That's one way to do multi-factor. You know that you shouldn't use the same password at seven different websites. You know you should have a, uh, a lock on your phone. So as an end user, really the key thing is, you know, understand the expectations and follow the expectations. That's really what you need to do to protect yourself as, as an end user, or maybe as an employee. Now, as a business leader, it's a whole different, you've got to just set those rules. And, and, and that's really the kind of strategic concept that, that we may talk about a little later today. Um, to protect a business, it's not one checkbox. It's not buy this firewall and you're secure. And it's not buy this service and you're secure. It's much more complex than that because cyber really is from business perspective, it's a risk. Just like you manage your risk of your competitors, you have financial risk, you have regulatory risk, all these risks business leaders have to deal with. Cyber is another risk. And that really is the mindset that these business seniors need to hone in on. You're never done with security. You're never 100% secure. It, it, it's, it's relative values of how secure do you need to be today. And, and, and that's what leadership should be thinking about. It's what's the right level of security for us and how do we get there? Now, the good news is, Peter, that idea of how secure do we have to be there's actually clarity in that space now. So 10 years ago, it was kind of an abstract, nebulous idea of, well, we should be secure enough. What does that really mean? Nowadays, as a business owner, you have clarity. If you look around, you can take time. You can see there are obligations in your contracts to be secure enough. Your cyber insurance has expectations for you. There's state and federal regulations. There, there's all sorts of guidance that you get. So if you just kind of listen and tune in as a business leader, you really can get some level of clarity on how security have to be and that frankly that's the first step businesses need to think through okay uh, you talked about the compliance so uh, state regulation federal regulation uh, and of course everything that is uh, part of the contracts with your uh, clients or suppliers uh, how about standards is there a cyber security standard that you would recommend uh, that uh, small and mid-sized companies uh, should uh, at least uh, take a look at in order to um, to see how things needs to be set uh, according to a certain standard that would uh, help them a lot or benefit them in in, in that sense. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And I, and, and, and I, I like the question because not enough people think that way. So your goal of cybersecurity should not be, I feel like we're secure enough or Terry says we're secure enough. That's where these standards, and I'd use the word framework, really come into play. So these frameworks are out there that exist that really give you kind of a roadmap for what do you need to do to protect your business. Um, common ones are there's ISO is out there. Uh, NIST cybersecurity framework is out there. Uh, there's other things that are kind of framework like um, I know the FTC and Small Business Administration have. And there's all sorts of guidance out there. So I really leverage those guidance uh, picking the one that fits you. So if you're a big billion dollar company, you're going to have a, a very complex framework and standard you're going to follow. And frankly, that's going to be the, a big driver for your cybersecurity program. Um, the, the neat thing is it talks holistically about your cybersecurity program. So it'll say your framework will talk about, do you know where all your stuff's at? Do you have the contracts in place? Do you have the protections in place? Can you detect bad activity? Can you respond to bad activity? If all heck breaks loose and everything blows up, can you put it all back together? So the, the, the value of the framework and the standards is it helps you think through broadly what you need to do. That being said, if you're maybe the, a business leader or a smaller company, these big frameworks are gonna be overwhelming and frankly, you're not gonna get it all done anyway. Mm -hmm. So you need to find a right size framework or, or standard to follow. So if you are a small company, I would suggest go to uh, in, again, U.S. audience, I'm assuming here, Small Business Administration, FTC, go Google Small Business Administration Cybersecurity. They, they've got simple framework of about 30 questions that'll walk you broadly through all these areas of focus. So that would be one standard. Another one I'd suggest, Peter, um, is 
most businesses use cloud technology these days. So your email, uh, maybe using Gmail, maybe using Microsoft Office, maybe using QuickBooks Online, maybe using Jira. So all these cloud technologies a lot of companies use. Go take time and, and review their standards. If you have a LinkedIn account for your business, have you reviewed LinkedIn suggestions on cybersecurity? If you're using Gmail for your office, have you reviewed Google's guidance on cybersecurity? Um, so there, there, there's kind of application specific guidance, or again, use the word standard, but for each of your technologies, there is guidance from the vendor how to secure it. Go spend two hours a year going through it, just reviewing, you know, is your Twitter properly locked down? Is your Outlook properly locked down? All those sorts of things. So uh, a lot there, but I, I would suggest there is guidance out there if you find the right stuff. Okay. Uh, one uh, important question, or uh, I, I think that it's relevant. Uh, you you suggest that uh, we should know the standards and suggestions that our suppliers are using. Uh, is that also why uh, companies hire you? So that uh, <laughs> you help uh, them disperse the information uh, among their uh, employees and uh, to push what is uh, content that everyone should be aware, uh, aware of. Is, is that part of uh, what you do? Well, it, it's interesting. That, that's been a big driver, frankly, of my business. So it, it, when I started doing this independent security executive stuff about eight years ago, the big drivers are really two scenarios, Peter. It's one is, hey, we've just been hacked. We got, a, we, we got a fire we have to deal with. And number two is, I've heard of someone who got hacked, so I'm worried about cybersecurity. So those are the two big drivers we have. Nowadays, they're saying, and, and boy, probably 80% of my business in the past year has been based on the fact that I cannot sell my product because the buyer isn't convinced I'm secure enough. Okay. So when you sell to a hospital, to the bank, to the government, to the military, even to individuals, there's expectations in cybersecurity that the buyer, that the prospect has. That needs to go into consideration when we think back to that phrase, Peter, of secure enough. You know, with the right, right level of security for your business, that needs to play into it. So, yeah, translating those expectations from your prospects and clients into your cyber program, that's critical because nowadays the big driver, especially for small, small, mid-sized businesses, is you got to be secure enough to sell. And, and if your buyers aren't convinced you, 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 you can, you're secure enough, they, they won't buy. And, you know, there's contracts are being lost because that, that, that conversation is, is, isn't happening. Okay, another hot topic is AI and cybersecurity. Um, the most common uh, points of views are two. One is that uh, modern tools utilizing AI help uh, hackers and crackers uh, uh, crack our uh, security faster and more efficiently uh, because uh, they are able to learn on the job and do multiple tries and uh, apart from uh, DDoS attacks uh, and similar, uh, they can do a lot, a uh, lot smarter things uh, just because they have so many info from all the forums and uh, all the reports about previous attacks. And they also know all the versions of uh, our software and our apps uh, and all the shortcomings of, of uh, these apps that we are using. And another thing, can uh, AI that we are using internally um, weaken cyber, uh, our cybersecurity uh, because it gets data from the internet? Uh, the answer to both is yes. It, it, it's yes. So from the attacker perspective, uh, actually from the defender perspective as well, AI is making both parties better and more efficient. So the bad guys are using AI um, the big thing we're seeing these days is these are artificial intelligence to create better social engineering attacks. So social engineering is the old school. Hey, Peter, this is an email from your partner. Um, can you please change my bank routing information for the next invoice? Those emails that come in that try to trick you into doing something or clicking on something, those are getting better and better and better. And our tools to detect those are getting worse because the, the emails are better crafted. So yes, the bad guys are using artificial intelligence to be more uh, efficient at what they do. Conversely, the protectors, the defenders are using AI as well. 
uh, from the technical side, AI is baked in a lot of the cybersecurity tools that 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 the engineers use these days. So the ability to detect, to respond quicker, to better see chains of attacks. Uh, it's, it's, it's a tool being used by both sides of this war, <laughs> frankly, uh, making both sides better and more efficient. But it, it's an arms race like it's always been. Um, and then maybe the second part of your question, Peter, you talked about the use of AI. So if you're a business owner, you've got your, your staffs using AI. That's great. AI is a fantastic tool. If used correctly, <laughs> a little caveat there, if used correctly, it can certainly add a lot of value to your business. But what it means is that your business is now using data in a different way. So in the old days, maybe you had spreadsheets and databases and cloud stuff, and you knew where your data is, and you knew you, knew you had to protect your spreadsheets and your databases and clouds. Now your data is starting to flow all over the place. So if Peter takes some kind of report, drops it in chat GPT and says, give me a summary, your data is gone. So effectively the risk for businesses with AI is that there's new data flows going and wherever your data moves, you need to be aware of it to protect it. Because again, we talked about there's expectations. You have contractual expectations, regulatory expectations to protect the data. But if the data is moving now and you're not tracking it, you know, you, you may fall short of those expectations. So the big risk of the use of AI is against just being used in new ways and you're not aware and you're not properly protecting that. Okay, and now I will ask you uh, the least desirable question. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, uh, what, what would be the, just that's uh, uh, through, through the thumb, it's, it's not important that it's, it's really precise, but uh, what would be your recommendation for a small and mid-sized uh, company, how much of their turnover uh, should be budgeted for their cybersecurity? Uh, the, the million dollar question, how are we gonna fund all this? So that, that that's always the big question. Uh, well, first let's start with a statement, Peter, that cybersecurity isn't necessarily a um, significant capital uh, expense or capital or expense. So those, it's not necessarily dollars you have to spend. You have to spend some certainly because you have to buy tools, you have to buy services, whatever it may be. You have to buy licenses. A lot of cybersecurity though, the proper protections are not technology-based, but they're people-based and they're process-based. So we talk cybersecurity protections. Again, the guidance is technology, people, process, technology. Those together are the proper way to secure your business. Um, on the process side, there are not a lot of costs. So you think about the one of the most common cyber attacks out there is uh, what's called business email compromise. And that's that's what I described before, Peter, where Peter gets an email, someone pretending to be your partner. Hey, can you please change this bank routing information? You change it. And then the next invoice flies off to some bad guy in Russia. That's business email compromise. Technology is, is not the primary way to stop that. The proper way to stop that is training Peter, reminding Peter, we have processes in place. You can't just change bank routing information based on a single email. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I give you that story to remind you that this cybersecurity isn't necessarily just buying stuff. It's not buying technology. It's not buying services. You got you to gotta kind of support and protect the business and other means. So back to the million dollar question, how much do you spend? There really is not a set number. Um, when I was at big organizations, it'd be three, four, five percent of IT budget. Um, so I'm not sure exactly how that relates to small businesses. The other problem is some of these spends are not necessarily IT spends. So in the old days, it, you'd have budget for the company, then you'd have budget for IT and a subset of that became budget for security. But yeah. when you talk about things like changing how we do our contract reviews, contracts is a big part of cybersecurity days because it's shifting the liability around. Is that an IT expense? Um, HR processes that have to change to support cybersecurity. Is that an expense? Who pays for business resiliency planning? Is that a business expense or an IT expense? So anyway, the, the, the idea being that these protections and costs may be distributed through your company, but old rule of thumb was it was 5%. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that's a great insight. Is there any hands-on advice you can give to our uh, listeners and viewers uh, regarding cybersecurity, what, what is the first step they should uh, start thinking about uh, when uh, they would like to improve their cybersecurity? Sure. 
I, I, I tell you that the biggest problem I see with all my mid-sized clients, I always start off, it's, it's that they lack proper inventory. You know, do you know what your stuff is? And the stuff could be people. Most companies, you know, they think they do, but they don't have a good uh, tracking even of their people. Employees, yes, ideally. Contractors, vendors, guests, app users, those are all people. Do you really know who your people are and can you track them? Your contracts, do you have your contracts in place? Do you know who your vendors are and, 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 and your clients managing contracts, uh, technology, data? So the starting point for pretty much everyone, especially if you're behind the ball, is inventory your stuff. Make sure you know what you have. You can't properly deploy encryption unless you know all your technology and your data. You can't deploy um, business resiliency plans unless you know your processes and your contracts. You can't properly educate unless you know all your people. So, you know, the starting point for everyone, frankly, is, is inventory your stuff. Figure out what you have. And, and then from there, you can move forward. Okay. Is there any other uh, tips or, um, let's say, something that was recently in the news that you can present as, as, as a risk uh, or a cybersecurity risk that our listeners should be aware of? Yeah, you know, um, as, as a business owner, it's interesting. Um, it was, it was like, <laughs> every week there's a new story that pops up in the cyber. So there, there's a lot that we could talk about. But, you know, one that maybe impacts businesses that people don't think much about is uh, early 2024, there was behind the scenes a very large healthcare cybersecurity incident involving Change Healthcare. So, Basically, Change Healthcare facilitates a lot of the payments and, and the, the, the execution of, um, of, of pharmaceutical services. Okay. Mm -hmm. This was a, the Change Health was used by a lot of pharmacies and, and hospitals and tied to the insurance organizations. Change Health went offline and it significantly impacted all of these big, big players. So, um, you know, if you wanted to go to CVS to get your pharma your your prescription filled, you had problems. Um, a lot of small healthcare providers had a lot of financial constraints because they weren't properly being paid by Change Health. Um, I, I, I give you that story to help business owners think about the fact that no business is an island anymore. You most likely outsource your email technology. You outsource your payroll services. You may outsource, uh, I don't know, your financial services, your marketing services, um, your HR, everything. Everything gets outsourced these days. So more than likely than not, you've got some critical processes that your business depends on. That's not part of your business. What happens if that goes offline? So if your payroll service goes offline for two weeks, what does it mean for your business? Um, if you, if your HR system is offline and you can't onboard, what does that mean for your business, uh, collections, email, um, think about, and here's the practical tip, think about where you fit in the ecosystem. Who are your partners? Who are your critical vendors? And what would happen if they go offline? And, and, and the, the ask is not, how do you make sure they don't go offline? Cause it's very unlikely Google's going to go offline, but if they're out of service for eight hours, what are you going to do? You know, if, if your critical provider of financial services is offline for two days, what are you going to do? Um, so ask those questions, consider who you depend upon and just have a five minute conversation with your leadership team. What does it mean for our business if our critical provider is offline? It's happening a lot. A lot of people are getting bumped offline. It's impacting businesses. Are you implying that we need to have... Uh worst case scenario and also uh, damage control uh, scenario in place? A a absolutely. A, a recent uh, buzz phrase that's, that, that's been brewing in the industry, Peter, is called business resiliency. Mm -hmm. And business resiliency is kind of that worst case scenario. We're going to you know, ransomware, for example. We're going to do our best to ensure ransomware doesn't happen. And if ransomware does happen, we want to be able to respond quickly. But worst case scenario hits us and we're and our technology is down for four weeks. Is our business going to survive? And, and those are the kind of questions you have, have to ask. That's business resiliency. How does the business survive? Again, you want to make the bad things as um, you know least likely as possible. But if you get hit with ransomware, if your payroll provider goes offline, if there's a fire at your office, 
how does your business survive? So spending a few hours a year on that sort of exercise of how do we survive in these worst case scenarios? Um, it's just like in the old days it, in, in the US, FEMA was talking about have your, your hurry bag, I think they call it. So if a hurricane comes around and you're in South Carolina, do you have a bag ready with your meds and your clothes and some cash so you can blow out of there quickly? How do you survive the worst case scenario? Spend a few hours a year thinking about those scenarios because it's happening all the time. Your partners are getting knocked offline. Ransomware is shutting down businesses. Fires happen. Hacking happens. How does your business survive in these scenarios? Spend a little bit of time thinking about that. Another more political uh, question for the end, uh, before the end of this podcast is, um, it's in, in the mainstream, there's a huge... Um, uh, huge topics. Uh, uh, there are two topics, and one is uh, Chinese hackers, and another one is uh, Russian hackers as part of a hybrid war uh, scenario. Uh, how likely do you believe these scenarios are to affect small and mid sized businesses in the US? Well, it's interesting because that, that, that speaks to really uh, what they call threat modeling. So bad things are happening. I think about What's causing this to happen? 99.9% .9 of cybersecurity, nearly all cybersecurity issues that impact small and mid-sized businesses are not generally targeted. So it's not, I want to get Peter because he's Peter. It's, I find Peter has weak passwords. I find Peter's thumb drive sitting in, 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 in a parking lot someplace. Um, I find that Peter happens to click on an email he sends. So the vast majority of threats that business, small businesses have to deal with are just common threats that are out there everywhere. And, and the good news is, though, that the protections against these common threats are pretty well known. So if you do the basic patching, if you do multi-factor authentication, if you do backups, if you do testing, you're pretty well protected against 99, again, 99.9% .9 of the attacks that are out there. That's actually goes back, Peter, to the standards and the frameworks we talk about. Mm -hmm. Doing the basics will protect you in nearly all cases. Now, on the other hand, if China decides to target Peter, if China doesn't like Peter, frankly, Peter, you're in trouble. And, and if, if China and Russia wants to get in, they're likely going to get in. But if you have a good resiliency plan, you know, maybe you've got plans. If, if China knocks my data offline, I can survive if, as a business. Again, that, that fringe sort of attack may happen, you're probably not going to be able to defend against it unless you want to spend a lot, a lot, a lot of money, which will probably bankrupt you anyway. So the suggestion to, to small businesses, do the basics, protect yourself against 99% of the attacks that are out there, and the 1% become your business resiliency conversations. Okay, China can get in if they want to. How am I going to survive as a business? I've got backup plans. I've got alternate vendors. I've got paper records, whatever it may be. Um, don't defend against the fringe uh, outlier attacks. Just be, make sure your business can survive. Spend all your spend your time and effort in the ninety nine percent that are relatively easy to protect against. Thank you very much for all these insights. Uh, before we finish, uh, where can our viewers and listeners uh, find you? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Peter. It's been a pleasure talking. Uh, I, I work with a company called Tech CXO out of Atlanta, Georgia. And, and we're a collection of fractional executives. I happen to be in the cybersecurity space. So if you're interested in reaching me, go to techcxo.com. Just search for Terry or, or go look in the cybersecurity section. You'll find me there. Uh, thank you for all the insights again. And thank you for being my guest tonight. All right. Thank you, Peter.